The Trail, Chapter 22. Uh, when we left off, Moose had just been sprayed by a skunk. Moose is, has company by the flat rock. I spot a family, a familiar ball cap and bandana standing at a respectful distance from him. Sean, Denver. Hey there, Tony. Denver waves. How long have you been here? Just a couple of minutes. Are you planning on staying in the night? Yeah, at Newman tent site next door. Denver nods. Us too. Glad to see you caught up to us. Sean and I were heading to the hut to refill our water bottles when we ran into your dog. It doesn't seem as though he's having a very good day, says Sean. Mmm, complicated Sean. Moose thumps his tail sadly. The girl from heaven turns to the pile of stench curled in a miserable ball. This guy is going to need a good scrubbing. Do you need help? Denver asks eagerly. The more the better, says the girl. She smiles at Denver. I'm Abby. Denver. In that moment, I wish I were five years older and handsome and rugged and not a blubbery mess whenever I talk to a pretty girl. Denver has spoken five words and already he's gotten the girl's name and her smile. Jealousy flickers in me. Is this the type of drama you guys were looking for? On the other hand, Sean does not seem impressed with Abby's green eyes and long, dark, silky hair. I'm refilling my water, he says gruffly, and heads inside the hut. I hear tomato juice is great at getting the stench out, Denver says to Abby. No, that's a myth, I interrupt. Denver has been nice to me, but I'm eager to prove to Abby that I know a thing or two about skunks. It just covers the smell. It doesn't get rid of it. A few years ago, me and a friend of mine were volunteering at a rescue shelter. A dog came in and after being, after being skunked, and the way we got rid of it was hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and dish detergent. Abby pulled out her phone and double checks my facts. Looks like Tony's right, she says. I silently cheer. I've got that stuff in the hut. We can de-skunk Moose out back. Follow me, Abby says. I call Moose and he hops off his rock. He follows me and Denver and Ab as Abby leads us down a rugged path that cuts through the grass and rocks to a hidden corner of the hut. It's like a little hideaway surrounded by trees protected by the view from foot traffic. It's a, it's a surprise to find a secret place so close to the hut. It's even more of a surprise to find a turquoise kiddie pool dotted with pink dolphins, full of water, with a guy in a speedo and a forest of curly hair on his chest that lounging in it, reading a copy of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. He looks up as we approach and goes back to his book. As we get closer, the guy's nostrils flare. He gives two short sniffs. And then he's out of the pool and hopping, hopping about, holding his nose as water dances off his tight swimsuit. Miraculously, Harry Potter has stayed dry. Pool time's over, Dan, Abby says, or Abby gives Moose a tentative pat. Pepper skunk this little guy. We've got to get him soaped up. Dan wraps a towel around his waist. I'll heat some water, he says, and disappears through the side door into the hut. Wait here. Abby follows Dan and reappears shortly with a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, a bottle of baking soda, liquid soap, a sand pail, and, a, and, and an old threadbare towel. She mixes the de-skunking ingredients in the pail and fills it with water so it bubbles up. Here, Moose, she calls. Moose skitters back, whining. Here, let me try. I'm good with dogs. Denver rolls up his pant leg and steps into the kiddie pool. Come on, boy. He coaxes, clapping his hands softly. What do you guys think? Do you think Moose is going to listen to Denver? Moose hesitates. Denver crouches down. Here, boy. We're going to get you cleaned up. Denver reaches for Moose and hoists him into the pool. Moose holds still as Denver lifts him up, but as soon as his paws touch the water, he explodes. His legs pummel the air and his body twists like a seal. He headbutts Denver and the two of them pitch backwards, sending a massive wave across the pool. 
Sputtering, Denver emerges from the water, still holding Moose, who is yipping in terror. Moose, Moose, hey! A moment later, I'm in a moment. A moment later, I'm in the water with them, my arms hugging Moose's stinky body. Denver's let go and is busy wiping his eyes clear of water. I ignore the horrible reek of skunked dog hair and put my chin on Moose's head. I scratch behind his ears and whisper, it's okay, buddy, shh, it's okay. Moose trembles and quiets down. I stroke his matted fur, feeling the skin drawn tight over his still showing ribs. Even though he's feasted on bread and pasta for a couple of days, a lifetime of starvation has kept him horribly skinny. Keeping one hand on his head, I dip the other in water and slowly wet Moose down. Abby hands me the pail and I pour the mixture over Moose's back. I work my hands through his fur, gently scrubbing one side. I pick out twigs and untangled knots and work out clumps of dirt and crusted hair. Moose has closed his eyes and sits perfectly still, where before he was frightened of the bath, I think he's enjoying it now. When I have scrubbed all the, all the layers of dirt I use to empty the, the pail to rinse him off, Dan arrives with a large pot of warm water and I pour it over Moose. When I'm done, he jumps out of the pool and shakes himself off. He's clean for the first time since I met him and now I can see the splotch of fur on his chest is pure white. I pick up the old towel and ab that Abby's brought and rub him down. He still has a whiff of skunk on him, but only a whiff. As I dry his head, Moose gives my face a single lick. It's like he's telling me that it's okay, that it wasn't my bad luck that got him, but something bad that happened. And I figure out a way to make it better. It's then when I feel like Moose is really and truly my dog. I wanna go back a couple of sentences. This was a really powerful sentence. That it wasn't my bad luck that got him but something bad that happened. Let's think about that. Every bad thing, is it bad luck? Or just so happens that it occurred? That's a, that's a mindset shift. All right, let's keep going. That was a short one. Chapter 23. Abby invites Sean, Denver, and me to join the crew after the guests have been served dinner. After the leftovers are scraped into a mustard colored plastic salad bowls, we feast on ham and rice. Slices of, ooh, looks like chala, but it's pronounced hala. Slices of hala dipped in minestrone and boiled broccoli. The guests have gone through all of the homemade desserts. So Abby breaks out some Oreos and pours us glasses of milk. I break an Oreo in two pieces. I casually flip one half in the air and pray that it lands in my mouth and impresses the socks off Abby. I succeed, but a little too well. The Oreo chunk bullseyes my throat and a second later, I'm choking and swigging down milk, coughing with little explosions that send milk spurting out of my nose. I'm fine, I whisper hoarsely when Dan offers to give me the Heimlich. Denver breaks an Oreo in quarters. He takes a swig of milk, tilts his head back, a piece of Oreo flies behind his back and over his shoulder, landing with a plop in his open mouth. Where'd you learn to do that? Asks Abby. Envy wriggles through my veins again. I dab milk off my nostrils. Denver flips another quarter of Oreo into his mouth. My older brother, Harry. He had the sharpest eye and the best aim of anyone in the neighborhood. When we were in middle school, he could pitch a dime into a glass of water from 50 feet away. A third quarter of Oreo lands neatly on its tongue. Almost made it to the big leagues last year. Dan lifts his eyebrows. Why almost? The last piece of Oreo clicks off Denver's front tooth. He tries to grab it, but his hand goes wide and the cookie tumbles on the floor. Instead of picking up, he stares at it blankly. Did something happen to him? I ask. Yes. Denver's voice is short. A thick silence falls in the air. I shouldn't press. It would be mean, and I know it. 
but I'm so jealous of Denver's neat little Oreo trick that's making Abby's eyes shine that I lose my head and press. Was there an accident? No answer. Denver's shoulders hunch. He stares mutely at the fallen cookie with dimming eyes, lost in memory of what happened. I know that look. Oh, grief and numbness and disbelief at the unfairness of life. I've gone too far. Suddenly, I feel horrible. Hey, I'm sorry, I didn't need to pry. As if shaking off a nightmare, Denver's eyes come back into focus. He looks at me and sighs. <sighs> no, it's all right. He takes a deep breath. My brother was the star of the baseball team all through high school. His senior year of high school, they were 18 and 0. That means they won all their games. Three of those games had been no hitters. Harry threw a mean curveball, but it was his fastball that pegged him for the major leagues. He had it up to 91 miles per hour by the time his team got to the state championships. A big talent scout was going to be there. Harry was certain he was going to be drafted into the major leagues. He just had to pitch one perfect game. Then the night before the game, Harry and I got into a fight. It was over something stupid. What Netflix show to watch? I don't even remember. Denver bends down and picks up the or piece of Oreo off the floor. He turns it in his hand as if it's a magic eight ball with the answer, with all the answers. Funny how little things can change your life. We ended up wrestling for the remote. At one point, I grabbed it and yanked. Harry tripped over the couch. His eyes landed on the corner of the coffee table and that was the end of his baseball career. Without dusting off any dirt, Denver put the Oreo in his mouth and shoes. A few weeks later, he ran away from home. My parents were crazy trying to find him, but he was 18. Legally, he could disappear if he wanted to, and he did. We haven't seen or heard from him in over a year. Except for the soft tricking, ticking on the wall clock above the sink, it's quiet in the kitchen. Sean puts his hand on Denver's back. Come on, man, let's go to bed. He keeps his hand on Denver and guides him out the front door. As they head out, the glow of the hut light silhouettes them against the wooden floors, two shadows melting together to keep each other standing. Later, I head over to the tent site and set up next to Sean in Denver's tent. As I crawl in and zip up the mosquito netting, Moose hops in onto the platform. He turns a couple of times before settling down in front of the tent. As I fall asleep, I think about how surprising life is. I started on this trail because I wanted to get away from my bad luck and hurt in my life. I had run into plenty of trouble at the beginning of the trail, but right now, Andy's marble seems to be protecting me. But it hasn't stopped me from running into bad luck and hurt of others. Yet somehow, through sharing stories of the ways life can knock you down, there's friendship, understanding, strength. I think about Denver, how he's such a good guy and how the goodness became twisted into guilt over something that wasn't his fault. He'll probably feel responsible for his brother's accident for the rest of his life, even though it was just bad luck. I can hear Sean and Denver shifting on their sleeping pads in the tent next to mine. I'm glad they have each other. I think about the story Denver told me about how he and Sean became friends how they protect each other. Then I think about the story winging it told me about how people are thrown into bad situations and that none of their fault or bad situations that are none of their fault and how they figure their way through it. Maybe life isn't about luck or good or bad. Maybe it's a lot, a lot about learning or let's do reverse, let's try that again. Maybe life isn't about luck good or bad. Maybe it's a lot about learning. <laughs> I did it again. Maybe it's about leaning on others when things get rough and being leaned on in return. Um, I'm going to go ahead and highlight that one. This is my book. I, I can do what I want with it. It's a good one.
outside the tent, Moose turns and lets out a long, slow fart. <laughs> I smile. I started alone, but we're going to finish this trail together. Me and Moose, the other half of my shadow, Lucas. I promise, I whisper, I will see us through this all the way to Katahdin. 